Hi, everybody. Welcome to IEX Demos Breakout Room 2. We're happy to have you here. I'm Katherine Beckner. I'm the Innovation Program Coordinator and Innovation Specialist from the Central Virginia VA Healthcare System in Richmond, Virginia. We'll get started today, but I want to remind everybody that we want this to be an interactive time. We'll be monitoring the chat on this tablet, so please feel free to drop in your questions for our presenters, and I'll read them out loud. We hope you'll have a lot of questions and everybody will be interactive during this time together. We're looking forward to hearing about everyone's projects and initiatives during this hour. To get us started, we have Sean Rubel. Sean in the project Blind Rehab In-House Glass Fabrication, Improving Visually Impaired Veterans' Lives. Sean, I'll turn it over to you to get started. All right, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, like I said, my name is Sean Rubel. I'm a blind rehabilitation specialist at the VA Northeast Ohio Healthcare System. We had a veteran whose eye condition caused extreme light and glare sensitivity and required him to wear, always wear dark tinted lenses and specialty wrap style sunglass frames. One day after a nasty fall, he came into our center with his glasses and pieces. He was absolutely distraught and was in immense pain from the bright light and glare. Now, it would normally take a few weeks to order and make replacement glasses for this veteran, but my Innovators Network pro project allowed this veteran to receive the same exact dark tinted lenses and wrap style sunglass frame the very next day. Can you believe that prior to my project, our low vision and legally blind veterans were not even able to receive their prescription eyeglasses while they were here at our blind rehab center for training? Often, our veterans wait four to six weeks or more to receive their prescription eyeglasses. Imagine waiting six weeks to receive your new glasses when community optical shops can complete those same orders the same day or within the same week. Now imagine waiting six weeks and then being unable to drive yourself to your home VA optical shop to pick them up and have them properly fit. My project has solved these issues by making our low vision illegally blind veterans glasses on site here at the Blind Rehab Center. My project brought the Cleveland Blind Rehab Center a variety of lenses, ophthalmic and sunglass frames, and a lens fabrication machine to meet the unique needs of our low vision and legally blind veterans. This machine allows me to customize the prescription eyeglass lenses for each veteran by tracing the frame, creating a digital pattern, mapping it for exact sizing, and then grinding the lens to fit perfectly. In the short trial period, we have completed 85 eyeglass orders and have reduced the average turnaround time from order to issuance of the actual glasses from six weeks to five days with many orders being made the same day while the veteran waits. Not only have we significantly improved turnaround time, but have also saved the VA over $15,000 over those 85 orders. The most important part of that project though is the 100% veteran satisfaction with veterans and family members alike singing the praises of the project and their experience. Due to the success experienced here in Cleveland, we are now attempting to spread the program to other low vision clinics throughout our visit, including Detroit, Battle Creek and Indianapolis. We're also expanding outside our vision to other blind rehab centers in Chicago and Augusta. This expansion will see the Cleveland Blind Rehab Center attempt to extend the benefits of our program to these additional sites by making glasses for their low vision and legally blind veterans as well. With your support, we can continue to provide this service to our low vision and legally blind veterans here in Cleveland, but also see in-house eyeglass lens fabrication and VA sites across the country. Thank you. Wow, Sean, thank you so much for sharing that with us. It looks like just looking in the chat right now, we have another blind rehab specialist joining us. So it's awesome we get to share this and spread this concept even starting now. So congratulations to you. Um, I'm wondering as we wait for questions to roll into the chat, I'm just curious, what does your team look like and, and who all do you have working with you on the VA end and, and I guess even the veteran end? Uh, it's honestly started with me and um, our innovation uh, specialist, Bill Coquera. Um, and then once it kind of became an actual thing and kind of had legs, uh, our whole prosthetics department, um, the administration of our blind rehab center, um, our low vision optometrist, Dr. Nealon, um, it just, <laughs> people just kind of started jumping out. The team is just ever growing. It's, it's been such a, a wonderful experience that way too, just being able to meet all these new people and get them involved and have Blind Rehab's name get out there. And then, you know, veterans talking to other veterans like, oh yeah, if you go down to Blind Rehab, we can get you, get your glasses the same day. 
I can only imagine like what a good experience for veterans this has been. So that's awesome. I remember Bill telling me about this project early on and how excited he was. It's so much growth that it's happened. Um, I'm curious, what, what has surprised you most about this whole process and, and starting as, as an investee? Uh, I, I think probably the most surprising part was uh, how quickly uh, everybody else that's non-optometry, non-blind rehab was able to understand the importance of this um, and then what it would do for our veterans. I thought that was going to have to take a little bit more of like convincing and selling um, just because the concept is fairly foreign to to all of our uh, our processes here. But I, I remember the first time that I talked to our prosthetics department, the Visintent program manager, and I just kind of laid out what blind rehab does and then what I was attempting to do with the glasses and both of them just immediately were like yeah this is this is good stuff let's let's keep going and I was like oh that's it okay uh I thought it's got the twist of arms here but okay this is great awesome yeah immediate buy-in well excellent thank you so much for sharing this with us Sean and we'll get ready to move on to our next presenter thank you Sean all right next up we have Sherry Fedek with the project Emergency Department Screening for Intimate Partner Violence. Sherry, I'll turn it over to you and look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Um, so I wanna start out with a little story. First of all, imagine one night you're working in the emergency department and a 32 year old male presents with multiple bruises on his face and what appears to be a broken nose. He reported to the triage nurse that he was in an altercation with his neighbor. But during his examination, he confides in you that he is, his wife had punched him in the head and face multiple times. This is not our first act of violence against him. Intimate partner violence, also known as IPV, is a preventable public health concern and can become a healthcare emergency. And our veteran population, one in three women and one in four men will experience IPV in their lifetime. But in the civilian population, the stats are one in four women and one in 10 men that report experiencing IPV. IPV is not gender specific and veterans are disproportionately impacted by IPV. If they seek help, it is typically in the emergency department setting because of a specific incident or a chronic problem. The problem identified is that IPV has not been a focus for screening in the emergency department, resulting in missed opportunities and gaps in care for this vulnerable population. So how do we help our veterans? In early 2017, I was appointed to represent the Department of Medicine and the Emergency Department in a larger IPV committee at the Cleveland VA. During one of our meetings, the IPV Assistance Program Coordinator shared that many of the VA emergency departments around the country were not screening for IPV. I stated, we can do this, and I formed a committee to develop IPV screening in the emergency department that would address gaps in care for the veteran population. The educational training was developed and based on trauma-informed care guiding principles. All portions were reviewed with our staff psychologist, who is also the IPV assistance program coordinator. To inform our veterans of this program, we selected numerous posters from the IPV VA website, which are displayed not only in the emergency department, but placed strategically throughout the facility and restrooms. So what are our next steps and how do we know who to screen? We screen all veterans who present to the emergency department. Now you ask, what do we do with this information? In collaboration with our IPV psychologist and the Department of Social Work, a plan was developed that includes a warm handoff for veterans that are ready to seek help. This established plan provides coverage 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Our intent is to continue to pilot this project in the Cleveland VA Emergency Department and gather data with the goal of expanding the project to all other emergency departments in the VA healthcare system. Thank you. Wow, Sherry, thank you. Thank you for sharing your project. You already answered my first question, which was gonna be, so what's next, you know? And what if somebody screens positive? I'm wondering if somebody does screen positive, um, is there monitoring after the first initial step or where do you plan to take the project from there? So if someone does screen positive, we have set up in the emergency room 24 seven. Um, 
a connection to either the social worker or if the IPV specialist is, you know, if it's during her tour of duty, we would reach out to her immediately mm -hmm. um, so that there can be a connection with the veteran and they can, you know, set up time to discuss their issues and work out whatever they need to talk about at that point. And what's the veterans' response been to this screening being implemented across the board in the emergency department? So we are just now starting that. So originally, um, it was a Spark uh, part of the Innovation Network, and I developed the entire educational piece for this. It's on TMS. It's live in TMS, and our emergency department director, Dr. Amanda Pensero, has sent out emails to all the providers and nursing staff to ensure that everyone, you know, takes the the course. And they're they're starting to screen the veterans now. It took a little bit of time to get everybody on board because we do have some um, some physicians and even nurses that work there like just as a part-time position. So we have to make sure everyone is ready to screen and everyone knows what to do if they get a positive screen. And we also have a social worker that works in the emergency department who's been very helpful with this too. And she's kind of our direct um, line to the social work department to make sure everyone's taken care of. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for sharing this. And we look forward to seeing everything that will come from this um, during the pilot phase this this year, so thank you. Uh, thank thank you. you. Excellent, all right, up next, we have Carlos Castro Gonzalez um, with LUCO, a non-invasive white blood cell monitoring device to improve cancer chemotherapy outcomes. Carlos, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, thank you so much for the introduction uh, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, as it's been already mentioned, my name is Carlos Castro. I'm the CEO and co-founder of LUCO where we are developing the first medical device for non-invasive white blood cell monitoring. Now, white blood cells are important for a number of different patients, but they are particularly important for cancer patients undergoing chemotherapy. And we at LEUCO are on a mission to keep patients safe at their most vulnerable. Every year in the US, 850,000 patients start chemotherapy treatments, and 140,000 of them will need to be hospitalized because they develop an infection while their white blood cells are critically low as a consequence of their chemotherapy. When those infections and hospital readmissions happen, they bring very negative clinical outcomes, including 10,000 deaths every year, but also more than $4 billion in economic burden from this problem alone. Uh, next. So this is the critical and met need that we are addressing with PointCheck, our first product at LEUCO, and the first technology that can measure white blood cells without requiring a blood sample. Because we don't require a blood sample, that means that for the first time, this measurement can be done at home and much more frequently than with current technologies. And this is all based on innovative technology that we've developed while we were at MIT. And it works in a very simple way. Patients just need to insert their finger in our device. We take pictures through the skin for one minute, and we are able to make a white blood cell measurement. This white blood cell measurement is, they, is then transmitted to the doctors and to the patients. And the goal is to identify early those patients whose white blood cells are dropping to dangerously low levels so that the physicians can follow with preventive treatment. And that preventive early treatment can include prophylactic antibiotics. Alternatively, it can include growth colony stimulating factors. Those are drugs that boost the creation of white blood cells. And all of these interventions can help reduce the incidence of hospital readmissions and the negative clinical outcomes by 50% for that population. Next. So as winners of the Breaking Boundaries Challenge, uh, we are very excited to start a collaboration with seven BA clinical sites throughout the country. That collaboration will, be, will involve interacting with veterans and BA subject matter experts to get their user experience feedback in a real world scenario. In particular, veterans will be interacting with our physical unit, go through our user interface and disposable finger cartridge and make sure that the device is usable for them and we will also be working with key opinion leaders and oncologists at the VA to determine what is the best way to integrate our notification system into their clinical workflow to make a difference in the way these patients are managed. So through this collaboration, we have now an opportunity to transform the way cancer care is delivered for more than 50,000 veterans that receive chemotherapy. So if you'd like us to join us in this mission, please contact us at the information below, and I'll be happy to take your questions now. Thank you. Excellent. Yes. 
Thank you, Carlos. And to his point, you know, feel free to drop these questions into the chat and I'll be monitoring them. Um, Carlos, I know you're with the Founders Institute Breaking Boundaries Challenge and got hooked up with the VA through that. Um, has there been anything about collaborating with the VA um, that surprised you so far? Well, we were surprised by the number of sites that decided to you know, buy into our solution. So we were really, and also by the geographical uh, distribution. Uh, we are a Boston-based uh, company and we have had some interactions with Boston locally at Boston. So for us, it's well, surpri surprising and also exciting to uh, you know, be able to collaborate nationally. Uh, so that was one surprising aspect. Uh, that being said, we are just getting started. So we were just uh, winners of the last edition. We're having our kickoff call this Friday. So I'm sure that there will be many things that still we'll learn from this collaboration. Yeah, absolutely. I see Julie Whitney, the innovation specialist from the North Florida, South Georgia VA is chiming in about how excited they are to work with you. A question coming in is, um, it says, this is fascinating technology. Amazing you can change blood cells through the skin without a blood draw. Are there upcoming additional uses for this non-invasive imaging testing technology? So that's a great question. Uh, we are in, there are indeed many more uses. So we are starting with cancer chemotherapy. That's a population that has a high amount need for this technology. But the same technology can apply to many other immunocompromised populations that can also experience this problem. And we have identified problems for you know, uh, autoimmune disorders, multiple sclerosis, certain patients that take immunosuppressant drugs for Parkinson's and schizophrenia. Uh, and there are also possibilities to expand the capabilities of the technology so that we identify things beyond white blood cells. We can measure red cells, sickle cells. So there is certainly a lot of ways that the technology can go. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Carlos. I know there's a lot of excitement around this. And like every other project, we look forward to the future of this and seeing where this will be next year at IEX. So thank you. Yeah, we are excited as well. Thank you for having us. Absolutely. All right, up next, we have Mark Drinkwater. Mark will be presenting on improving consult workflow for mental health access. Mark, here you go. Great. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for listening to our pitch for Spark Investment in Improving Consult Workflow for Mental Health Access. Imagine you're a veteran seeking care at the VA. You might be in the primary care clinic, or maybe you're in an urgent care site or the emergency department. And during that encounter, it is discovered you might need mental health care. The provider you are seeing may be a mental health provider or may not be, but you need help. The next step in connecting you to care is for the provider seeing you to place a consultation with the mental health service. That consultation is then reviewed by an intake coordinator, a mental health clinician. If the referring provider picked the right consult and provided adequate information, the next step is to schedule the patient for the appointment. But that doesn't always happen though. And if the consultation is requested at the wrong clinic, it might be forwarded or canceled. If the appropriate information isn't in the consult, the intake coordinators need to do a secondary review and dig out information from the chart, maybe contact the veteran or the referring provider, potentially delaying access, or you might find yourself referred to a clinic for reasons you may question or don't understand. Utilizing methods we learned at MIT Catalyst and through participation with the VA innovation ecosystem and with the support gained as VA Spark investees, we have conducted interviews with referring providers, clinic directors, intake coordinators and reviewed consult tracking data, and we've identified pain points affecting when veterans receive care and how much effort it takes to get them there. Our mock-up prototype consists of two parts, a decision support tool for referring providers and a summary report for intake coordinators. The first component will help referring providers identify veterans who fit criteria for the general mental health clinic. When the referring provider selects the general mental health service, our prototype would identify consults that should be redirected or further reviewed prior to being submitted. The summary report will abstract from CPRS VISTA the relevant data about eligibility, previous mental health treatment, patient demographics, and geospatial data the intake coordinators need to select the appropriate clinic setting for the veteran. We've met with clinical access coordinators and using the existing CPRS framework and simple Boolean logic, this approach can work without changing the content of the current consult menu in CPRS. 
We hope that this tool will reduce delays in mental health care for veterans by facilitating the work of intake coordinators who decide how and where veterans receive care. Our prototype could be applied to other clinics in the mental health service line or in addressing consult workflow for other subspecialty clinics. Our team consists of Lola Baird, a licensed social worker, Trina Johnson, a doctoral candidate in health services research, Nanny Kim, a master's prepared human-centered design specialist, and myself, a nurse practitioner in the emergency department where I'm working today. We look forward to hearing your questions and ask for your support. Excellent, thank you, Mark. Sounds like you've done a lot of very important discovery in this early SPARC stage. Um, what has been the reception from the VA providers and everybody who's provided discovery for you? Well, so far the um, reception has been pretty good. We've met with senior leadership in the mental health service line here at Boston, and um, they've given us a, a favorable impression that we can go forward. And we're working closely with um, folks, both in the general mental health clinic, um, the primary care service and um, uh, uh, primary care embedded uh, mental health, which is of course the gold standard for providing care to veterans seeking mental health care in the primary care setting. Excellent. And as a Spark investee, just kind of generally, can you tell us a little bit about your experience um, as being a Spark investee and with the Innovators Network and what that's meant for you in this project? Oh, sure. Um, I think like some of the customer discovery tools that were discussed early on in the training seminars were really helpful for us. And also our, our innovation support specialist, Samantha Sissel, helped us here in Boston with um, getting access to you know leadership and and generally, it provides us a little bit of credibility when we go to talk to folks because uh, people in the VA are asked from outside sources all the time about what can we do to help you. And, and folks worry about your, your bona fides and, and, and being part of the Innovator Network helps a great deal with that. Absolutely, yeah. And so what's next for you and this project? What's the next step immediately? What are you thinking? So the immediate next step for us is, is um, as I said, we've, we've, we're working with um, some assigned folks from the mental health service line. Uh, our first step is going to get our intake coordinator report working with uh, local data in Boston VA. And then uh, if we can get that working consistently, we're going to seek access to through OIT for remote data so that it'll make it a more uh, inclusive and useful tool. Excellent. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing. And, you know, we look forward to the future of this. Congratulations. All Great. Right. Thank you very much for your time. Absolutely. All right. Up next, we have Joseph Iaquinto um, with how to determine if a nasal swab is a nasal swab, iteration, verification, and validation. Joseph, turn it over to you. Hi there. I'm Joseph Iaquinto. I'm a member of VA Ventures, a center for innovation to impact located at the VA Puget Sound healthcare system. As many of you are aware, the United States struggled with supply chain limitations in the first year of the pandemic. This provided an opportunity for flexible manufacturing methods such as 3D printing to quickly pivot and attempt to address scarcity. Nasal pharyngeal swabs, despite being an inherently simplistic product, experienced shortages, leading to a number of companies to ponder the question, what if they developed a 3D printed swab? Suddenly numerous sources of not only 3D printed swabs, but the machinery to make more of them were appearing everywhere. So how do we know if a swab is a swab? A team of us at the VA Puget Sound Healthcare System, along with teams at the Richmond VA, led by Melissa Oliver, and the Charleston VA, led by Nikki Beitman, set out to answer this question and to prepare to produce swabs in mass if needed during this crisis. We started with benchtop testing and considered geometry, material properties, and mechanical performance. We designed a go-no-go no go gauge to identify if the swab could be applied to an idealized nasal passage. We measured the mechanical performance at several locations along the swab. We identified if the swab could physically fit into a sample collection tube and whether or not the swab would break off and drop into the tube or would break off and flip out of the tube and fly across the room, which is not an ideal circumstance. For laboratory tests, we looked at whether the swab had the ability to gather and release fluid. We used water, then bacterial cultures, and finally use SARS positive and negative viral controls. These tests are important as traditional flock swabs have a tremendous surface area in their fuzzy tip. While 3D printed swabs have only a fraction of that area, 
but they may be well suited to capture droplets of fluid due to their geometry, such as a lattice tip. These tests and their results are available on the NIH 3D Print Exchange in the COVID Special Collection. Swabs that were performant in these areas and that were either commercially available or producible within the VA are advancing into a clinical study of nasal of uh, this efficacy and safety. Teams at Long Beach, Orlando, Charleston, and Cleveland VA medical centers are actively recruiting participants to receive two swabs, a traditional swab and a 3D printed swab instead of one when they come in for testing. We compare swab performance to determine whether using a 3D printed swab would have yielded the same clinical test result as using a traditional swab. So returning to the question of whether a swab is a swab, our answer was first to perform due diligence in testing clinically relevant functions of the swab, second to establish FDA registered swab production within the VA uh, for use if needed, and third to work to confirm swab performance in a controlled clinical setting. So in conclusion, I'd like to acknowledge the numerous clinical partners and contributors who helped us develop our tests and who enabled our clinical study, as well as the funding and material support provided by ORD Innovations and Logistics. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joseph. Um, I know this has been no easy feat at all. Can you give us an idea of just the manpower and the hours that have gone into this project since this research study, rather, since it got started? Got it. So the entire endeavor, the testing, development of swab production capability and research study is our, our teams and teams of people. So we had the three different sites um, that each established the ability to produce um, the same type of swab within their locations. We had a quality management system through VHA Dean that oversees the whole process and is basically our documentation and our, and our methodology. Um, as we produced and, and tested these swabs, the, the study itself, we had you know, uh, great local site investigators at each of those locations that stepped forward and said, you know, yes, we can help you perform this, this study. Um, and each of them have study coordinators and then swab teams at their sites and the laboratories that are, that are doing the swabbing, performing the tests and sending us the data. So it is, is quite a team effort. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and tell me, you know, uh, with your background in research, did you ever think nasal swabs is, is what you would start studying? <laughs> I didn't. My, my traditional background is in uh, musculoskeletal biomechanics, primarily of the lower extremity. Um, so, you know, a variety of things kind of pulled me into some of the crisis response when the pandemic started. And then this, you know, this, this scenario, you know, swabs, I think, caught, you know, you know, the U.S. unaware that this, there's going to be supply chain crises like this and that swabs would be one of the things affected. So it just kind of speaks to the kind of the nimbleness and agility of innovations and of some of the technologies such as 3D printing to be able to shift gears and try to dive into quickly addressing, you know, a question or an unmet need. Yeah, absolutely. No doubt. What a shift this whole year has been. Well, thank you very much. We appreciate this. And one last question, if we want to know more about um, how to enroll in this study, is, is there a website or something we can go to that you can drop in the chat or it, is recruitment closed? Got it, got it. So recruitment is ongoing. If you're at one of those uh, VA medical centers, so Orlando, Charleston, uh, Long Beach, and Cleveland, um, if you go in for testing, there may be someone there you can ask them uh, is there, you know, can, how do I engage in the nose study? It's a, a nose study is the, is the name. Um, but you may also just encounter a, a recruiter there or a poster that has contact information. So keep your eyes out if, if you're at one of those locations. Sounds good. Thank you, Joseph. We appreciate it. All right. Up next, we have Lindsay Thibodeau with the Dementia Sensory Cart. Lindsay? Hi. Imagine sitting in a room that is dark and unfamiliar. As you look around this room that is stocked with machines, poles, and various wires, you realize that you can't remember how you got here. Suddenly you are startled by a loud beeping noise and a stranger enters the room. As she walks towards you, she speaks, but you can't quite understand what she's saying. Before you know it, she grabs your arm and tries to poke you with a sharp object. The more you try to pull away, the more this person attempts to make further attacks. Then a second stranger enters the room and assists the first stranger in holding you down. You spend the rest of the day scared, confused, and tied to a bed. This scenario is a scary reality and displaying the experience of a dementia patient who is hospitalized in an acute care setting. There are currently over 6 million Americans living with dementia 
And that number is expected to triple over the next 20 years as more of the population continue to age. Special emphasis and consideration must be placed on caring for them and their unique needs. So how do we do this? My innovation project this year was called the Dementia Sensory Cart. We were successful in producing two prototypes, which are currently being tested and utilized on the acute care units in the VA hospital in Biloxi, Mississippi. These mobile carts are easily accessible and stocked full of items used to create a therapeutic environment. Items such as fidget boards, baby dolls, aromatherapy, music, tactile toys, memory care activity books, and string lights are used to engage the patient in meaningful activities, as well as provide distraction and redirection. The dementia sensory cart is a cost-effective way of creating a therapeutic environment, since transforming and modifying an entire hospital room is not feasible. Staff are able to easily maneuver the carts between patients and have a variety of interventions to choose from in their attempt to provide comfort and a calm environment. These carts aim to alleviate stress and anxiety to both staff and the patients. Through the use of these items, our goal is to decrease the level of agitation and anxiety, which will in turn decrease the instances of falls, restraints, and the use of PRNs. Caring for someone with dementia can be challenging and it's truly a calling. Paying attention to their sensory needs and environment allows us to provide quality care and enhance the overall health and well being of these patients. Today, I invite you to support the Dementia Sensory Cart. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, you know, I think we can all imagine this impacting somebody that we care about with dementia and, and how important this project is. Can you tell us um, how did you decide what to put on the cart and have you refined that? Yes, yeah, so um, we had several meetings with staff actually on our long-term care dementia units, um, as well as our recreational therapy department, um, and also the staff on acute care units. Um, and we really kind of looked at the objects that we utilize on our long-term care units with the residents who live here and um, came up with items that um, were both um, therapeutic and then also we had to of course pay a close attention to the infection control aspect so the items had to be easily sanitized and um, easily placed on the cart and maneuvered so it was very much a group and joint effort in really looking at what was feasible and also um, what would be most beneficial from an infection control standpoint. Mm -hmm. Absolutely and has there been any one item in particular that you found has been kind of a, a go-to favorite? I see you nodding. Oh. There must be. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Aromatherapy is the number one go-to item. And it makes sense because on our long-term care units, we use a lot of aromatherapy to really kind of soften that environment and make it therapeutic. So um, the acute care staff have voiced the same, that they, um, they utilize that aromatherapy all the time. And then second would be probably the music followed by the fidget boards. Mm -hmm. With the music, is there a decade you all tend to stick to or is it, is it pop music? Is it? <laughs> <laughs> we kind of do, we did some soft classical music. We also, I bought some CDs with some nature sounds and some things like that. We try to stray away from, um, you know, like heavy metal and things like that. And, um, but also the patients can also bring in some favored music if their family members have CDs and music that they like. But we try to stick to the more therapeutic nature and softer classical music. Absolutely, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Lindsay. Thank you for sharing this project with us. Thank you. Thank you. All righty, everybody. Up next, we have Brian Lehman. And Brian will be presenting 3D printing orthotics and prosthetics. Brian? Hey, good afternoon. I'm here today to share with you about advanced digital manufacturing process that is sharpening the future of, of healthcare and embarking on the world of orthotics and prosthetics. To some, the process is called additive manufacturing. To others, simply just 3D printing. As I reflect on the progression of my orthotic and prosthetic career, starting with Plaster Paris, followed by the enactment of 3D scanning and CNC carvers, along with the latest immersion of 3D printing, 
I noticed an important pragmatic development that would provide benefits such as saving time, reducing costs, as well as collecting and storing outcomes for future references. In comparisons, traditional methods such as plaster of Paris takes time and often a skilled individual to perform these fabrication methods. Not to mention, this process is not easily duplicated or even provides the ability to store for future reiterations. Transitioning from plaster of Paris into the onset of digital workflow, I noticed the benefits of implementing 3D scanners and CNC carvers. I observed that this time, increasing productivity and decreasing the time it took to produce the initial stages of test sockets. <clears throat> given this, we had the ability to produce what traditionally took days or weeks, given the circumstances, to just a few hours. And even within that same visit, even though we can produce a prosthetic device in such a short period of time using scanners and carvers, it is still time consuming to the individual performing this technique. The practitioners or technicians will commit two or three hours nonstop technical interaction. And to my point, this is where the future of growth of digital manufacturing of orthotics and prosthetics partnered with 3D printing will refine the current process. By leaning on 3D printing to assist in the fabrication, allowing them to work with and for our practitioners, this process has shown to give time back to the practitioner, reduce material costs, and yet still allow desirable end results. I have a handful of success stories, but I will share with you one. One of our amputee veterans had to be admitted to the hospital due to health issues. As he transitioned from inpatient to our in-community living center, the rehab team set goals that would ultimately involve discharge. Being that the patient spent an unfavorable amount of time out of his prosthesis, he could not immediately don the socket due to excessive fluid that made the prosthesis impossible to fit. At this time, I quickly scanned the patient's limb, modified, and sent it to a printer. Being that it was at the end of the day, the printer worked overnight and was able to have a new 3D printed socket the next morning. After a few days of walking with his 3D printed temporary socket, the patient shrunk down and was able to don his current de uh, definitive prosthesis. Limit his time spent in the hospital did not um, display or uh, warrant any kind of discharge within that week. All this was around $100 to 45 minutes of time. The goal is to develop a program that will network 3D scanners, specific softwares, and 3D printers to assist our practitioners at local facilities, central fabrication hubs, and even mobile practitioner units. By shifting this technical interaction within process and allowing the digital workflow to give back time to the practitioner, which will then directly benefit the reason why we desire the process by providing care to our patients, our veterans. Thank you, Brian. Thank you very much. Um, same day service, that's incredible. And overnight, even in this case, yep. um, what, a, what an impactful story. I feel like I already know the answer to this and the listeners probably do too, but like across the board, what has been the response from veterans? Oh, they love it. Uh, yeah. Veterans, practitioners, uh, therapists, uh, everybody is on board with this when it comes down to the, the service and, and care that we can provide using this, this uh, process. Yeah. Have there been any surprise use cases that you maybe didn't envision when this started and now here you are? Yeah, I think some of the adjustable sockets I'm working on uh, that allows um, to be able to fluctuate with the, the sockets and designs, I think that's some of the benefit in the future coming uh, down the pipeline. Yeah, and I'm getting, I'm getting some hand signals here, thankfully, that there's a chat, a, a question coming into the chat, sure. um, wondering, are these 3D printed prosthetics cheaper than the standard ones? Yes, uh, currently, in, depending on what process you use, we can definitely see a benefit in a reduction in cost and time. Uh, early on stages, such as a test socket phase, and then we're looking at some of the definitive sockets as well. And that veteran satisfaction piece, you know, like how to quantify that in cost. I mean, that's got to be worth, hard what, a million determine. bucks? <laughs> that's right. It's yeah. hard to determine. Absolutely. So what do you see as your next step in the plans for this? So currently, uh, getting a better understanding of our facilities and the workflows uh, on, on local levels and also national levels, and then expanding uh, the network and calling on other departments such as Biomed and OIT to work together to really try to streamline this process. All right. Well, we look forward to that. And thank you very much for sharing this with us today. Thank you. Absolutely. All righty. Up next, we have Deborah Cole presenting the Atlas Knee Supporter. Deborah?
Hey, Alexis, I can't hear her. Okay. Oh, okay. Hey, hey, Deborah, we can't hear you. You're going to have to unmute. One sec. Go ahead and, yep, it's all right. You can start over at the bottom. You'll see an unmute button. Um, I know Deborah. Deborah's with the Richmond VA, so um, I'd normally be sending her a text right about now, but I don't think I can do that from this app. So, Deborah, let's see if we can hear you now. Okay, part two. Okay, there Hello. you go. Part two. Here you go. <laughs> Hello, my name is Deborah Cole, and I'm an x-ray tech at the Richmond VA Hospital, and I work in the interventional pain clinic. Ouch, stop, that hurts. That is what I hear from veterans during knee procedures when I started in the clinic in 2016. I saw that patients were unable to hold their legs still while doctors are placing four needles in their leg. Could you? These needles are placed all the way down to the bone, and I can almost feel their pain while I x-ray them. I see them flinch, wiggle, and hold the sides of the table while they're trying to hold still. The only method we had in the clinic were pillows and sheets to hold the leg in position. That was not acceptable or suitable platform for these procedures. Um, I knew I needed to do something to keep the leg position, the knee aligned, and the veteran comfortable. I searched the medical catalogs and Google, but I couldn't find anything out there that we needed to do these knee procedures. I also checked with prosthetics to help with the design, but the prototype had too many moving parts and I wanted a streamlined, user-friendly device. I kept thinking of a way and I decided to make one on my own. So I came up with an idea. So I had to use my imagination. I went home and made a cardboard prototype at my kitchen table. I had all the craft that surrounded me and a mess to clean up, but I was determined. I applied for the SPARK program to bring this vision to life. Although it took me three tries, yep, three tries, I stuck with it. And in 2020, I received a SPARK investment to make what is known as the Atlas Knee Supporter. So here is my homemade prototype. Very ingenious, right? <laughs> I designed the supporter to provide an ideal height for imaging of x-ray equipment, x-ray detectable so zippers and pins don't show, support that entire leg from the thigh to the ankle to prevent movement, conform at the hip to give a natural rest and knee position, provide, excuse me, a supportive and stable service for the leg to not sink in with the weight of the leg. The, the device to not just sink with the weight of the leg. I now have two designs of the Atlas supporter in the Interventional Pain Clinic and Oncology, and they're in two sizes and they have been in use since February, 2021. The use has provided decreased radiation exposure, rescheduling procedures, use of anesthesia, and increased um, decreased procedure time in veterans are very comfortable and love the Satisfaction. This is the new prototype that is being used. Thank you for your time. And I appreciate with everything that's happening, the new seed program that I am in, in will make me go to other avenues in the hospital. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Deborah. Your, your, um, your invention has come a long way since that green initial prototype. Congratulations. <laughs> Um, Thank you. Tell us, I, the, the veteran feedback has been very positive. Um, can you share with us some of the thoughts veterans have had in using this device? Yes, um, a couple of my patients, they liked it so much they wanted to take it home. And it wasn't even covered, the you know FDA regulations or VA prototype regulations, but they really loved it. Yeah, absolutely. And what are, what are other clinicians thinking about this device? Oh, they love it, and especially down in oncology, which I really started in our clinic, the pain clinic, but they love it, the residents and fellows and definitely staff. I mean, they said, give me that thing again. I mean, even though they know the real name, 
people, but they love it for the leg. <laughs> excellent, excellent. All right, and I want you to know that you are getting a shout out in the chat from Dr. Pai, who says, great job, Deborah. Love the Richmond Interventional Pain Clinic. So there you go, a big <laughs> shout you. out, congratulations. Um, and Julie is asking about the prototypes in use. Where are they in use and what does that look like? Um, right now, definitely the pain clinic and radiation oncology. Oncology had the same problem. They were using sheets and pillows to keep the legs straight when they were doing their patient planning and they didn't have anything there. So when we actually had a demo, uh, in-person demo um, at the VA, they said, oh, I like this. When it comes out, let me know. And I contacted the clinic and they said, oh yes. Yeah. So they have three for each of their machines and they have two sizes. If, especially if a leg has um, a larger girth. Yeah, thank you so much. You're probably gonna be having to let a lot of people know when more of these are available. Thank you, Deborah. <laughs> we appreciate you sharing this with us today. And thank you so much. Absolutely. All right, up next, we have Leandra De Silva um, presenting on the iBot rollout. Leandra? Sounds good, excellent. Thank you, so uh, hello and good afternoon to all. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, I am with the New England Center for Innovation Excellence, and we are a fairly new member of the VAJ innovation ecosystem. Uh, in preparation for the iBot rollout, uh, we started formalizing our center and our mission became very simple. We wanted to find innovative products, services, and ideas that would improve the quality of life for our veterans' health and well-being, bring them to the VA, uh, through innovation channels and spread them locally, regionally, and then nationally through the many networks that we have. And we do focus on three areas. We'll focus on rural access to world-class healthcare, health and lifestyle solutions to aging veterans, and technology solutions for chronic and complex illnesses and injuries. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the iBot personal mobility device rollout. And that came about as a result of the Department of Veterans Affairs efforts to help transform veterans healthcare services. The VHA entered into an innovation collaboration with Mobius Mobility, in which outlined a donation of 25 iBot personal mobility devices to the VA, where each of our spinal cord injuries and disorder centers would receive a device to be used for demonstration and training to our veterans. And in addition, 25 devices would be donated directly to veterans in needs based on the outcome of the clinical assessments. Uh, throughout our tour, our team observed firsthand the relationship and the trust that exists between the veterans and the care team at each one of these locations. We heard, we participated in so many, we call the magical moments. And what it really means for the care team to identify the correct mobility device to solve the mobility, the mobility needs for each one of our veterans in needs. So it was in direct alignment with our focus area to complete the coordination and delivery of these devices to 25, 22 of 25 SCID centers in the nation so they can have that available to showcase to veterans as they look to complete clinical assessments to solve their mobility needs. Veterans with interest in the iBot should definitely speak to their providers and have a discussion on what does it mean for their clinical assessments and is, the, is this device the right device for them? We believe that veterans across the nation will benefit from our SCA centers having this device for demonstration and training. And in conclusion, uh, we believe the availability of these devices in addition to the many other devices that our SCI centers has to demo and train our veterans for mobility needs are another example of how the VA continues to seek innovative products in support our, of our veterans quality of life and make sure that we continue to provide the gold standard of care that they come to expect every time they walk through one of our facilities. We are very excited to be part of the VAJ innovation ecosystem and we're looking forward to the future. Thank you. Thank you, Leandro. And thank you for sharing that. I'm curious, what made you, um, you know, decide that the iBot was one of these innovative tools and um, devices that you were seeking to spread to your area and others throughout the country? 
No, absolutely. So uh, that's a great question. So we continue to look for technology solutions for innovative products, anything that we can bring in that may be new to the VA. It may be a new service, a new product, a new idea that we can provide to enhance the quality of life that we provide to our veterans. So any opportunity that we have to reimagine our care, reimagine our quality of life, continue to reinforce again the gold standard, mm -hmm. we want to bring that into the VA locally, regionally, nationally. Yeah. I, I know I think you called them magical moments and I'm sure they were. Um, can you tell us about one example specifically and how and how the iBot really or this care model impacted a veteran? Oh gosh, you know, uh, we visited, personally visited over 20 SCI centers, many discussions with veterans, you know, uh, this may go way beyond three minutes, but I'll give you a quick one. Uh, throughout an event in one of our centers, we had a veteran on an iBot and he was on two wheels in an iBot. So he was at uh, close to six feet tall. He's a, uh, so he spent the majority of the event, which was uh, on two wheels. And shortly after the event, his wife approaches him and us, and we begin having informal discussions. She reaches into her pocket and gets her phone and says, uh, can you please take a picture of this? So she stands next to her husband that was injured on active duty a long time ago. And uh, we proceed to take a picture. Come to find out, she says that that was the first time they have ever been able to take a picture while standing on eye level outside of a swimming pool. And it gives me chills just thinking about it and observing how emotional that is to the care team, observing it all. And again, a magical moment in their relationship and their life. And we were so truly, truly honest. It was, it was amazing to be part of it. So we have moments like this all throughout our tour. And now we love on what this means to the quality of life to veterans along with every other service that we provide as a VA. Thank you, Leandro. What a nice moment. Thanks for sharing. All sure, right. thank you. Thank you. All right, up next, we have Puneet Vidya with um, presenting Hitting the Target, Pre Precision Transcranial Magnetic Stimulation for Medication Refractory Depression. Turning it over to you. You're on mute, let's see. Sorry, rookie mistake. Okay, okay thank you for the introduction. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, major depressive disorder is the leading cause of disability worldwide. Unfortunately, one third of individuals do not respond to antidepressant medications. There's a treatment called transcranial magnetic stimulation or TMS for short, which can be effective in this group. It essentially involves a coil like this hooked up to a machine like that. This coil generates very powerful magnetic pulses, which in turn can stimulate brain cells underneath the center of the coil. In the case of depression, we target an area marked on this mannequin here with a dot uh, in the prefrontal cortex, which we think is important for mood regulation. And the way we do it in clinical practice, we just kind of eyeball it. We line up the coil as best we can to the center of the coil, and we do our best to keep it in that position for the duration of the treatment and repeat that day after day. However, veterans uh, will tell us that every day I'm coming in for treatment, it feels like it's hitting a different spot. Um, and as a, a psychiatrist at the Cleveland VA for several years working in this field, I thought there's gotta be a way, a better way of doing this. And with the help of the Innovators Network, I've uh, been working on a, a device to improve the accuracy and reliability of coil placement with TMS. So this is the latest iteration of the prototype. It's a very thin device here, and it can attach to the bottom of traditional TMS coils to improve functionality. Um, it, it just has a bunch of sensors and a wireless transmitter, and it couples up with the monitor. So that way, the TMS operator, every time they're placing this coil on a veteran's head, they can see that it's accurately positioned and on target. So this is just like a, a quick demo of what the screen might look like. It'll have a little dot showing you where the target is and how far off center it is. So right now it's not optimal, but I would reposition it before I would do a treatment. And it would allow the operator to know that it's on target for the duration of the treatment, uh, five days a week for four to six weeks. So now I have on the uh, slide here, I can show you the outcomes of our, uh, uh, of our uh, pilot testing. Uh, I'm not sure if it's up right now from my angle, but uh, well, okay. So on this slide here, you can see essentially the accuracy of the different methods of coil positioning 
with respect to what is the ideal position. And so lower deviation is better. And not surprisingly, the visual technique in the dark blue bars had the greatest degree of uh, deviation from ideal. The device here, which I'm calling TMS Align, uh, was statistically significantly better in all domains of uh, positioning uh, with significantly less error. Uh, which was pleasing to see. And we also looked at another technique called neuro navigation. This is like a gold star, gold standard research uh, uh, standard, where, which involves like this 90,000 hour system with cameras and optical trackers. It's not very uh, easy to use in a clinic, but we were pleased to find that the TMS Align worked almost as well. Actually, uh, statistically, it was, it was the same as the navigation system and substantially uh, less costly. Uh, so I appreciate the assistance from uh, Innovators Network and support in this project over, over the number of years that it's been in development, and I'm uh, looking forward to continuing to work on it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you for presenting and sharing this. Um, I know you said that this has been in development for a couple years. Can you tell us about where it started and how you've gotten to where you are today? Oh, sure. So it started as just kind of like a project in my... Uh, uh, in my home lab, so to speak, uh, just tinkering with electronics because I like to make things. But uh, this is the first thing I made that was actually useful, I think. And I brought it up to the uh, innovators specialist, um, innovation specialist at Cleveland. And um, they told me, hey, you should you know, apply for a Spark uh, um, uh, application and see if you can get some support from the innovators network. So with the help of the innovators network, I, I created this as my earlier prototype of the coil. It's a little bit bulkier. And uh, over the years, uh, you know, refined it to something smaller. So it, it started this way. And uh, over the process of um, participating in the Innovators Network and Human Centered Design and learning about all the things in the workshops about how things can be improved, um, it's been refined. And I hope to continue in that path. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, has there been anything about participating in the Innovators Network that surprised you about VA's approach to innovation or how you're able to implement things? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because, uh, you know, I, I think as another speaker said that, uh, you know, generally people don't think of the VA as uh, a place for a lot of innovation. But since participating in Innovators Network, I've been really blown away by how many brilliant ideas are, are growing out of the VA and originating from here and spreading not just within the VA, but outside the VA. And, uh, and that is encouraged. You know, I think outside the VA, there's no chance, uh, you know, I'm a psychiatrist, I'm not an engineer. There's no chance I would have gotten any funding to, to be tinkering with electronics and making these sorts of, you know, cool things. And so uh, I, I think that's, that's been a really great opportunity being in the VA and uh, getting the support to uh, participate in these uh, innovations. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm sorry we're out of time because there is a question in the chat, but I'll just ask you and anybody to, you know, feel free to chat in the chat. Um, as we move on to our next presenter. Thank you so much for Thank sharing. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, Daniel Murphy, you are up next. Daniel with Oath Aging Care. I'll turn it over to you. Hi, I'm Daniel Murphy, and I'm the founder of Oath Aging Care. Just want to do a test and make sure y'all can hear me. Very well, thank you. Our team at Oath is standing with VA providers to help older veterans and their caregivers through our intelligent platform for aging well at home. This is Luis. Luis is a 75-year-old Vietnam veteran who receives care at his local VA. Since Luis has difficulty getting around the house, he has been referred for community care to a VA-contracted third-party provider. <clears throat> However, his VA providers have no visibility into the care he is receiving at home, and Luis has offered very little insight into the quality or performance of his in-home service providers. This lack of connectivity makes care coordination difficult for his providers and the, the experience for, for Luis, unfortunately, is less than ideal. The healthcare industry has long recognized the home as the preferred setting for aging. <clears throat> According to AARP research, more than 90% of older adults prefer to stay at home as they age, and the home is always less costly than a facility setting. Knowing the VA is an industry leader in both geriatric and home-based care, VA providers know first home that care received outside of the facility is often highly fragmented and, high, and difficult to coordinate, especially in rural areas. <clears throat> Unfortunately, hundreds of thousands of veterans are facing these challenges and VA providers ready, readily acknowledge there are no easy solutions for their patients once they go home. We're solving for this complexity through our platform for aging well at home. We've been selected as a winner in the IEX Breaking Boundaries Collaboration Challenge and are collaborating with the VHA Innovators Network 
Our project is being led by Brent Aguilar, innovation specialist from the San Francisco VA Health System, along with three other VA locations. This collaboration will start with the discovery phase, where we take a human-centered design approach to better understand challenges currently facing older veterans. Next will be a testing phase, where we will pilot the use of our software with a group of VA providers, older veterans, and their caregivers. The goal of this collaboration is to model a pilot to help older veterans age well in place through the use of our platform in multiple markets. Our solution radically simplifies aging care for veterans and those who care for veterans. Using a web-based interface powered by advanced analytics, we offer a suite of features that create a one-stop shop for aging well at home. Our care coordination features leverage data from multiple sources and use machine learning to build a patient-centered plan. Similar to TurboTax, the plan connects veteran needs with benefits and services. Our provider marketplace features help with the selection of home and community-based providers using scoring based on those providers' quality and performance. And our mobile features can protect against fraud through a claims integration and digital claims processing for home and community-based services. Our team has built a similar solution that is connecting hundreds of Medicare Advantage plans with thousands of in-home service providers nationally. And now Oath is pivoting to help veterans. We look forward to our collaboration with the VHA Innovators Network and this incredible opportunity to help veterans age well at home. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you very much. I know that you are um, selected as a collaborator from the Founders Institute Breaking Boundaries Challenge now working with these VAs you mentioned. Um, has there been anything about working with the VA that has been, you know, something that you didn't think would happen, something, something new um, and surprising for you? To, to be quite frank, the swiftness which with, uh, through which the VA was interested in the product and able to incorporate a, a non-paid pilot was, was completely surprising to me um, and, and welcome as a veteran myself. Um, knowing that the VA is leaning forward um, as, as much as I've seen through the Innovators Network was, uh, was quite surprising, to be honest. Yeah, I, I'm sure. Um, and thank you for sharing that experience. Um, I know you mentioned you are a veteran yourself. What um, sparked you to, to make this, to design this concept and to approach the VA? Yeah, I appreciate the question. Um, I've since retired from the Army in 2014. I've, I've been in the aging care space um, and, and have seen many of the challenges connecting payers with, uh, with the patients or, or members um, who need care at home. This is prevalent in veteran populations as, as well as other populations. And, and as I mentioned, both is, is our opportunity to design a, a, a product specifically for veterans that addresses veterans' needs. And this opportunity to collaborate with the VA is really amazing for, for our team and for our product and ultimately for veterans. For sure. I think we can all imagine some, some folks in our own life who would prefer to age in place and how this concept may be useful. Well, thank you so much, Daniel. Thank you for your service, and we appreciate um, you sharing this with us today. Thank you. Thank you. All right, up next we have Kimberly Potter. Kimberly will be presenting on the VA 3D Biofabrication Community of Science. Kimberly? Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Kimberly Potter. I'm in the Office of Research and Development. Um, and I'm going to ask you to imagine it is the year 2030. And imagine you've been in an accident and you've suffered a traumatic injury. There's a possibility that you'll lose your leg. Now imagine lying in an operating room where the surgical team works to clean and debride your wound. At the same time, a reconstruction team is working with imaging scientists, bioengineers to reconstruct your damaged limb with the help of computers, and images of your damaged limb and your collateral limb or a body atlas. Using artificial intelligence algorithms and a virtual reality technology, they carefully and precisely design what is needed to fit the bill. Using many of the tools developed for 3D printing, your computer design limb is now encoded so that it can be interpreted by a biofabrication device in the OR, where, which can lay down the essential elements for bone, muscle, nerve, blood vessels, and skin for whole limb reconstruction. Just like an intricate pattern woven into a biological tapestry one layer at a time. Now think of more immediate surgical solutions possibly accessible in five years. For example, um, we have, I just have an image here of a bioengineered blood vessel to return blood flow to an ischemic limb or bioengineered bone to stabilize a bone tumor site or a cartilage patch for an old knee injury. Now I'm asking for your help to build a 3D biofabrication community of science to make this future a reality. 
we have surgeon scientists and biomedical engineers willing to invest in a team science approach to work on the challenge of point of care biofabrication to replay or replace diseased or damaged tissues in our veterans, but we can't do it alone. We need to leverage the expertise of our 3D printing network against research tissue engineering protocols developed in the lab and move this science into the OR. And we're gonna need the support of industrial partners to de develop the operating room infrastructure to receive these biofabrication approaches. And we need to engage our regulatory partners to help develop a robust development pipeline to ensure that each biofabrication solution meets the highest regulatory standards for safety and efficacy. Finally, we need the support of our leadership and the courage of our veteran patients and the entrepreneurial spirit of our veteran students um, to help us address what it really means to return our veterans to whole health. I'm Kimberly Potter in the Office of Research and Development. I'm asking you to support our bio, 3D biofabrication community of science to make the operating room of 2030 a reality. So if you're really excited about this um, and you are interested in point of care biofabrications, you have skills um, and expertise, I ask that you participate in our survey and our exhibitionary materials and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Kimberly. <laughs> this sounds really fascinating. Um, how, how can folks access this survey if they would like to participate and provide their um, information and their feedback? Yeah, so we have exhibitionary materials and you should find either a QR code or a link to a survey monkey. Um, tell it's a it's 11 questions mostly tell us about yourself and then tell us how you want to be involved we're really you know interested in leveraging expertise a constellation of expertise to address this really complex challenge but if we all work together I'm hoping that you know we'll get a lot of acceleration and potentially move this technology to the OR thank you absolutely I'm wondering, Kimberly, where do you see, like what is the top thing that you see about the future of this in 2030, as you said? Well, um, like I said, you know, the, the, the industry is really pushing for the solution, but where we have the barriers is really in the research, right? Is how do we do this? And people were able to do it outside the body as I've sort of demonstrated by some images, but now we really need to be doing this. And sort of that's where the research element comes in um, to solve those problems, but it takes a really integrated approach because now we really need to do it inside you, start doing those experiments inside you so that it can be received um, through animal and human studies and things like that. Um, so it's a kind of a, a sort of a challenge, but maybe in, um, we'll have something in the foreseeable future. Yeah. Very exciting. Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for sharing. And I encourage everybody um, in the chat to go ahead and take that 11 question survey and provide some, some good feedback for the future of this project. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, up next and last but not least, we have Terry Olinger presenting on the Droppies. Terry? Uh oh, Terry, you're muted. There you go. Have you ever had a patient labeled as non-compliant? Well, I have. And it almost cost him his eyesight. I asked him why he wasn't using his eye drops and he simply asked me he couldn't squeeze the bottle. And I knew at that moment I had to do something. Hi, I'm Terry Olinger and I'm the nurse case manager for eye surgery at the Cincinnati VA. And this is Droppies. Droppies is a simple, easy to use eye drop delivery system designed for those with limited dexterity due to conditions such as ALS, rheumatoid arthritis, Parkinson's, or just generalized weakness due to aging. As an eye care manager, I've noticed patients who squeeze their eye drops too hard and use too much product, which lead to over ordering or ordering more product and increased costs or patients who don't use their eye drops at all because they can't squeeze the bottle, leading to poor outcomes and low self-esteem. So I took to the internet looking for something that would help them and I could only find products that would help squeeze but not regulate how hard and some that helped aim but not squeeze. Nothing that did it all. So I started drawing and I came up with a product that may, might help them 
And it was then that I got an email from Lindsay Reigler, um, my innovation specialist. And uh, I applied for and was awarded investment dollars for Innovators Network. I collaborated with the University of Cincinnati engineering students, and we came up with a prototype and using uh, utilizing human-centered design, we demoed that first product, tested it, took the feedback um, to Pixel and Timber, and they came up with our latest prototype. Our current prototype is interchangeable for any size eyedrop bottle. It has an iPad that's soft and can position against the um, orbital bone for stabilization and has a more ergonomic handle that is easier to use. In the future, we look forward to seeing widespread testing and feedback. Droppies is a squirt gun-like prototype that no matter how weak or hard your squeeze, it'll only deliver one drop, it'll stabilize the dropper and help aim. It meets all the patient's needs, it improves outcomes, decreases costs, and improves self-esteem. You just drop the bottle in, lay it against the eye, and squeeze. Drop ease. It's that easy. Wow. Thank you so much, Terry. That is a super catchy line that I'm sure you will keep with this project for a long time. That's excellent. It looks like you may just have create you have created the all-in-one device you were looking for. Congratulations. Um, yeah. Can you tell us, does, is this being used by folks right now? Well, what we are doing right now is um, in our spread uh, is we're developing an additional prototypes and we are going to do them at several sites in the Vizen and test them again. Um, and hopefully this will be the last shot and, and we've come up with the product we want. Have you, throughout the evolution of this, um, had to pivot or change where you thought you may end up and make modifications along the way? This is actually the fourth prototype. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Congratulations for sticking with it through four versions. Um, where will this be spread throughout your visit? Which medical centers? Um, hopefully Cleveland and um, Columbus, and I'm looking into um, Indianapolis. And uh, you know, we can get some interested folks to drop their information into the chat and reach out to you too. So this can be a little PR for you, Terry. Um, and, and what, do you think there's gonna be a fifth prototype coming? I hope not. <laughs> I hope this does it, but if it needs tweaking, then certainly after this testing, we'll go back to the drawing board and tweak it some more. Yeah, absolutely. And um, you know, our vet what are veterans thinking about this? They love it. Mm -hmm. They absolutely love it. Um, they said they're, I get calls every once in a while asking if it's out yet because they've heard rumors. I'm sure so. you do. <laughs> yes, well, thank you so much, Terry. We appreciate you sharing this with us and we appreciate all of our presenters today and our audience. Thank you for being here and participating and sharing all of this information with all of us. Up next, we encourage you to go back to the main stage for the Shark Tank competition.